Great. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um, I'll, I'll first start by saying I'm, I'm obviously not John Swarley, who's the Managing Director of the Penn Center for Innovation. Uh, unfortunately, John um, was not able to attend today. He um, uh, unexpectedly had a death in the family, and so um, sends his sincere apologies. Uh, he very much enjoys this meeting, so he's, he's sad not to be here. Um, um, and I'm Ben Dibbling. I'm the Deputy Managing Director at the Penn Center for Innovation. And for those who don't know the Penn Center for Innovation, uh, our team's focused on identifying and implementing relationships with the commercial sector to facilitate the development of new products and services based on inventions and discoveries um, generated by Penn's outstanding faculty and research scientists. So whether the end result is a new venture, a corporate alliance, a licensing agreement or sponsored research agreement, PCI serves as a one-stop shop for engagement of the commercial sector with Penn. Uh, PCI had another record-breaking year for commercialization activity in fiscal year 23 across multiple research sectors. Uh, I'll spare you the metrics, uh, but I would encourage you to check out Penn's year in review, which is published on our website. And it's truly a pleasure to be here today, and I'm, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to welcome so many alumni, colleagues, collaborators, and friends of Penn to what is uh, the seventh annual Innovation at Penn event at the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference here at Warden, San Francisco. It's wonderful to be back here in person after our involuntary break um, associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but I also want to extend a warm welcome to the folks who are joining this event virtually. And not to dwell on the pandemic, um, but I wonder whether we'd all be here today and so eager to hear about today's topic, the future of mRNA technology, if we hadn't all had the opportunity to experience firsthand the power of the mRNA technology that is incorporated into the BioNTech, Pfizer, and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we're very proud at Penn of the contributions made by Dr. Drew Wiseman and Dr. Katie Kariku and the enormous impact that this technology has had on public health on a global scale. In addition, we're extremely excited about the future um, that this new modality promises and, um, uh, for the development of new vaccines and therapeutics. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce this exceptional and, and I would go as far as to say star-studded panel. It's always really hard with such accomplished individuals to capture the totality of their contributions. And hopefully you'll forgive me um, for trying to keep my introductions brief so we have as much time as possible for the panel discussion. So our moderator today, um, farthest to my right, is Dr. Beth Seidenberg, a well-known and very successful biotech investor and the founding managing director of Westlake Village Partners. Since 2018, Westlake Village Biopartners has raised more than $820 million in capital, investing and incubating 20 life science companies. Prior to starting Westlake Village Biopartners, Beth was general partner at Kleiner Perkins. And I'm proud to say that we've had the pleasure of working with Beth and her team at Penn, most recently in connection with Kite's planned acquisition of Team Unity a Penn startup company co-founded by Carl June and colleagues. Um, speaking on our panel today, we have Dr. Mike Mitchell, the Peter and Jerry Skirkinich Assistant Professor of Innovation in the Department of Bioengineering at Penn. Mike keeps us really busy, um, but in a really good way. Uh, his lab's research lies at the interface of biomaterial science, drug delivery, and cellular and molecular bioengineering with the goal of understanding and therapeutically targeting biological barriers. Current research projects include the synthesis of novel biomaterials and nanoparticles for the delivery of nucleic acids, including mRNA. His discoveries and inventions have a variety of potential applications, including cancer therapy, engineering, engineering of immune cells for immunotherapy and vaccines, and novel drug delivery technologies for tissue engineering and, and regenerative medicine. Next, we have Dr. Laura Shorva, President and CEO of Capstan Therapeutics, a biotechnology company focused on mRNA and targeted lipid nanoparticles for cell therapy. Capstan is very well known to Penn uh, and the PCI team, given that the company was co-founded by uh, a truly outstanding group of Penn faculty, 
including Doctors Carl June, Drew Wiseman, Bruce Levine, John Epstein, Alan Pure, Stephen L. Belder, and Hamida Perez. Capstan licensed key intellectual property from Penn and has numerous active collaborations with our faculty. Prior to Capstan Therapeutics, uh, Laura was president and CEO of Silverback Therapeutics, a biopharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical company advancing a pipeline of therapies that are systemically delivered but locally active and targeting fundamental disease pathways in cancer, fibrosis, and virology. She served in this role until 2020. Um, she served in this role from 2020 until the company's merger with ARS Pharmaceuticals in 2022. In addition to a number of other successful CEO roles, Laura is also the founder of the Clarity Foundation, a nonprofit organization which helps women with ovarian cancer improve their treatment options. And last, uh, but no means least, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Katie Carrigo, who'll be joining us uh, via, via video. Katie's work includes the scientific research of RNA-mediated immune activation, which resulted in the co-discovery with Dr. Drew Wiseman of certain nucleotide modifications that suppress the immunogenicity of RNA. It was this discovery that helped enable the development of therapeutic and vaccine applications for mRNA. The technology is being used by BioNTech and Moderna in their COVID-19 vaccines, as I mentioned earlier, in addition to other vaccine and therapeutic programs in development. And in recognition of this historic discovery, Dr. Carrico, along with Dr. Wiseman, have been the recipients of, a, of an ever-expanding list of prestigious national and international awards, including the Alaska DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award and Time Magazine's Hero of the Year 2021. Dr. Carrico has been associated with BioNTech since 2013, where she has served as Senior Vice President since 2019, and she holds an adjunct appointment in the Perlman School of Medicine at Penn. Finally, um, a big thank you to the law firm Sal Ewing, both with respect to their sponsoring of this event and also for the world-class service they provide in securing intellectual property protection for Penn's groundbreaking innovations. And with that all said, I will turn over to Beth. Great, thank you. Wow, magic happened. I'm watching Lori panic because, Katie, we didn't see you until a moment ago. Welcome. Uh, you just had a uh, well-deserved, beautiful introduction. Uh, thank you, Ben, uh, for those lovely words and uh, introducing this panel. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, nice to see people in person. Um, this is the first JP Morgan, and it's really a delight to, uh, in since the pandemic, to see people again and uh, interact. And those who are joining online, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I, I am confident that this is going to be a very interesting discussion for you with, um, with these incredibly talented uh, scientists and entrepreneurs who are joining us today. So mRNA has changed the world. And uh, Katie, I know you've had many uh, compliments and uh, gratitude, and um, we are really grateful uh, to you for your groundbreaking work and, I would say, saving the planet. So thank you. Um, I really think she deserves that major uh, accolade. So Katie, it's been a journey as many of these things are, when you have an idea, you're toiling away in a laboratory, have a vision. Sometimes people don't see the vision the way you do. I'd love for you to start the panel today to share with us a little bit about that journey, some of the highlights, some of the lowlights, and um, some insights around the technology. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I wish to be there. I am sorry. I am not there, although seeing today the uh, news from San Francisco, maybe it is better to stay here. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so from outside, it seems uh, many times, you know, the failure, but uh, myself, I enjoy it and uh, see the uh, progress, what um, I was doing and we were doing with our colleagues together. So I, 
I uh, grew up in Hungary and I started to, as an undergraduate, started to work with lipids and we formulated and made liposome and delivered nucleic acid as an undergraduate in the end of the 70s. And then I did my PhD. I was synthesizing RNA. Those were shorter RNA, but all in uh, my life, it was actually working with RNA and coming to the United States in the 1985 I work at Temple University again, working with RNA. We did a treated patient with double-stranded RNA. Those were HIV patients that was in the 1986-87, try to induce their interferon system. Then uh, I work, uh, you know, 24 years at University of Pennsylvania from 89 when I started to work with mRNA. So prior to that, I work with different kind of shorter RNA molecule. And some of them I synthesize chemically, some of them enzymatically. And of course, you know, in a pen, I started at cardiology and um, with the help of Elliot Barnett, and we started to figuring out that how, you know, we could use mRNA for therapy. So even in Hungary, we tried to make an antiviral compound. So it, even in ba doing basic science, it was behind it always there that was to be what we are doing has to be some useful. It has to be useful. And then, uh, you know, in neurosurgery, I spent 17 years and with the help of uh, uh, David Langer. And uh, so we started to develop something for, for patients who had stroke and try to figure out uh, how together with our knowledge put together, we can develop a product. And in uh, and, uh, 1997, I met uh, Drew Weissman at the uh, Xerox machine, yes. Luckily, at that time, I could not download it digitally, the papers, because four years later, I was already digitally downloaded. I never went to the Xerox machine, but that time, <laughs> still, you know, sometimes it's good that the progress is not that fast. And so I met him and, and we started to work together and, and we discovered together that the messenger RNA which is conventional and I used before and I couldn't see any immunogenicity and I've never been worried about because in the case of uh, <coughs> in the case of a patient, you know, I, we just want to overexpress uh, protein which already present in the body. So I was not worrying about some foreign protein, but it seemed that the RNA anyway is very immunogenic and we drew shoulder to shoulder, we work and then figured out why it is immunogenic and then come up with how to make it non-immunogenic. And so, uh, and so that we worked together like uh, up until 2013. Then I, we together also established the company. And uh, so we, I had that kind of experience at that time. And then moving to Germany, so I work at BioNTech at that time. It was a very small company. We were on, on the campus and then, you know, we started to use the RNA, the nucleoside modified RNA, as well as the conventional RNA for therapy. And uh, so that was 10 years of commuting between uh, Philadelphia and uh, Mainz. So, but, um, so that, that was, um, that is my story. <laughs> I have to say that I never wanted to make a vaccine. I want to make the RNA non-immunogenic so that uh, we can use for patients who already have other inflammatory problems like, you know, a stroke patient. So, And Katie, your, your story didn't end there. You um, had, I think, a seminal meeting um, with, between BioNTech and Pfizer. And tell us about that. Tell us about, you know, how do you, how do you move from, you know, a research lab at a, at a company with a handful of people to basically, you know, a pharmaceutical company deal that leveraged the technology again to save so many lives? So um, in um, BioNTech, I had a team finally, because at, at Penn, I was working uh, uh, with my own hands, I was my own technician and whatnot. But then uh, we had a team, and then we uh, started to improve, uh, you know, the, making the RNA more effective uh, and um, different kind of technology. We introduced different purification and whatnot. And uh, 
And of course, the BioNTech is an immuno-oncologic company, but you know, you need money. And if somebody approaching you with, you know, um, offering some money and then um, you know you you are able to do that kind of work, then then you try to negotiate and and uh, and that happened we biotech we had a, a infectious disease program started in 2015 and then um i also included in uh, this uh, uh collaboration uh, you know uh the westman i introduced uh, ugur zahin when he came ugur came here 2013 then ugur we invited Drew to uh, uh, BioNTech, so he gave lectures, and so that there was a collaboration between the company and uh, between Penn. And of course, you know, we um, approached by 2018 uh, Pfizer and prior to that other companies who were interested to develop uh, RNA-based uh, uh, infectious disease vaccine. And um, and so it is. Um, it it was uh, already under development for it, and it was just for influenza vaccine. That was the interest of Pfizer at that point, and we signed it 2018. That, I think at the same time when uh, BioNTech signed with Penn and with Drew Weissman uh, agreement. And so for for any development, for you know, you need a component of academia. You need uh, experts, uh, clinical experts, and you need smaller company, you need large company, and they can work very well together if they figure out how to do that. And uh, so so we we did uh, all of this uh, uh, program already with Pfizer, uh, 2018, 2019, and uh, was tested out the formulation and other things, and and it uh, worked out very well. And so it was just uh, when um, two, two years ago, three years ago, three years ago, yeah. So then 2020, when it happened, then it was just you know it was easier to switch over to another. Uh, virus and make another vaccine because you know the uh, demand for developing quickly a vaccine but at that point you know the influenza vaccine was developed and well, ready for human trial and and what what timing katie um and thank you you're just in the nick of time um this whole meeting here in san francisco jp morgan meeting um, is about networking, and many of you, and we'll hear from Laura and Mike, are talking to pharma partners and um, exploring opportunities, and Katie's story should hopefully inspire all of you to, um, at least from my perspective, learn a couple things. One, as uh, Eugene Kleiner from Kleiner Perkins taught um, many of us, when they pass the hors d'oeuvres, take one. <laughs> Somebody's coming to you with money, and as Katie said, you never know where the next financing or opportunity is going to come from. Be open-minded, and um, you know, take take the hors d'oeuvre when it's passed. And thank God for that. Um, Laura, you are running Capstan, and you are, a, as um, as Ben highlighted, a very experienced CEO. You've seen the ups and the downs of our industry. What inspired you to join Capstan? And tell us a little bit about how you're utilizing the technology, the mRNA technology, for yet another application and opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Beth. And um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's great to see um, some familiar faces and also meet, meet new people. And yes, uh, Capstan is the beneficiary of uh, of uh, UPenn's amazing machine for developing novel technologies. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a scientist by training. Um, so I'm a, a, a pharmacologist. I was a classically trained pharmacologist back in the early 80s. So that was drug metabolism and toxicology. And after that, um, uh, it was, I, I finished my PhD, it was a sexy thing to clone something, It'd take years <laughs> and years, now any high school student can do it, but I wanted to learn to clone something and I was going to do that 
the postdoctoral fellowship in the first lab that we would allow me to clone something. And I serendipitously landed in the field of oncogenes growth factors and signal transduction pathways, where I stayed um, for many years until my first CEO gig back in 2002, which, by the way, is not something I ever aspired to. Yeah. I love being a scientist. I still love being a scientist. It's how I define myself. Um, and it's just something that happened. If I could work in the lab today, I, I, I would. I love it that much. And I think it is that um, principle and that curiosity and the love of discovery that has continued to drive my choice of companies and how I arrived at Capstan. Many people will tell you that I'll go anywhere for cool science. Um, and of course, um, Capstan has that in spades thanks to um, the founders at Penn and those that went before us, both in terms of you know, mRNA and mRNA delivery, but also cell therapy. For those of you who don't know, Capstan is a company that marries those two technologies. I have said in the past that if the COVID-19 vaccine and cell therapy had a baby, they would create, had created <laughs> Capstan. They did create Capstan and what comes out of that, which is the ability to reprogram cells in the body. And that um, was, um, would not have been possible a few years ago. So I think, you know, why, why did I go to Capstan? I think, you know, we all understand uh, some of the challenges, uh, some of the limitations, as you pointed out, Beth, I've been at companies that um, have been very successful. And how do we define success? You know, to me, it's helping patients. Yeah. It's not selling our companies. Um, even though we do that, and that's important for our ecosystem um, because that gives money back to the investors who go back and reinvest that. Um, so, you know, I was at Synthorix, and that company was acquired by Sanofi for $2.5 billion. And uh, Silverback was not um, as scientifically successful, but from an investment perspective, probably wor worked out. And, uh, and so Capstan is this amazing technology um, that is at the cutting edge. We're not the only ones, um, but it's where medicine is going. And um, 10 years ago, cell therapy didn't exist. 10 years from now, cell therapy probably won't exist. Yeah. Well, it will exist, but without Different. the cells, yeah. differently. Yeah. Um, and uh, it takes all of us to move the field forward. And we do that, and Capstan does that, I do that thanks to the many, many people that have been at the lab methodically working on a problem for many, many years. And then suddenly there's an opportunity for a company to, to, to develop products. Yeah. I'll stop there, Beth, thank you. Well, thank you. Those are great remarks and uh, thank you for your leadership in uh, behind several companies and, and in the industry, Laura. Really grateful for that. Um, so Mike, one of the challenges that we know exists with all these technologies is delivery, right? We have done beautiful, beautiful work in mice. We can deliver anything, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> um, but uh, the human body is a little bit more complex. And um, I had the, the wonderful opportunity of getting to know you and the technology that you're working on. And I know you're passionate about helping us find a way to expand the field and deliver. So tell us about what you're working on. And I know you've, I don't know if it's still stealth, but at least you know, you're know you hoping to, or you started a company and, and translate some of that work. But I think people would be super interested in a lot of the innovation that you're working on, uh, particularly on the delivery side. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Beth, and thank you to Penn uh, for having me here today. Uh, so as Beth said, I'm a bioengineer and I'm a drug delivery scientist by training. Um, I started my lab at Penn. In 2018, um, and before that, I was in Bob Langer's lab uh, at MIT. Um, and you know, from my journey in terms of looking at you know delivery in this space, is you know our lab really doesn't focus specifically on RNA, but how do we get different types of therapeutic molecules uh, into the body? Um, and actually, when I started my postdoc fellowship. Um, uh, back in MIT in 2014, I was really interested in the delivery technology for the mRNA vaccines, lipid nanoparticles, and RNA therapeutics. 
But back in 2014, um, it was very different how the field looked at RNA. Um, at that time, uh, alnylam pharmaceuticals was making a lot of progress on now, they're now FDA approved RNA LMP therapeutic on Patro, which is now um, an siRNA therapy uh, for targeting the liver. Um, and when I arrived in the lab at 2014, we weren't really in this mRNA era yet. Um, and when I wanted to work on our, uh, LMP technologies for extra hepatic delivery, people kind of looked at me and said, no, LMPs, they go to the liver. They're really good for liver applications, um, but we can't get them to other places. Um, and then over the course of my postdoc fellowship, we saw amazing advances in RNA therapeutics, mRNA, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. And once we started getting our hands on these technologies that people like Katie and others were developing, we saw that LMPs are capable of going beyond the liver, going beyond vaccines to target different cells and tissues in the body. And when I started my lab uh, at Penn in 2018, it's really focused on that. How can we develop new LMP technologies that can now target, say, your central nervous system, the brain? How can we target muscle? How can we now deliver RNA therapeutics um, into the lung? Um, and we're developing these technologies, but not only, as Beth said, you know, we could do this really well in mice, um, but we're very interested and we're very fortunate to be at a place like Penn uh, where we have great clinical collaborators now to translate these into large animals um, and ultimately humans. Um, and we're now at the stage now where we're launching a new company in this space uh, called Liberate Bio to really to chip away at this extra hepatic delivery challenge to see if we could target a range of cells and tissues across the body. Great vision. I, I'm, uh, we're going to watch this with interest <laughs> and hope. Um, that's great. Thank you, Mike. You know, one of the one of the common themes here, as as we listen to these um, three incredible panelists, is um, it takes about a decade, right? It takes patience, it takes courage, and um, a lot of time and a lot of money to get these technologies to ultimately, um, hopefully, be therapeutics or um, uh, therapeutic interventions for. Uh, for humans, for patients. Um, I'd love to hear, actually, you're going to have three very different perspectives here from um, all three panelists, Katie, uh, Laura, and Mike, about their insights from um, academia to industry. What is that transition and, and uh, translation like? What's worked well? What would be advice? You have a lot of people in this audience who, uh, whom I assume would benefit greatly uh, from hearing about your experiences, both the positive and negative, and, and some insights. So Katie, let's start back with you, and then uh, we'll ask the other com panelists to comment as well. So as an uh, academic scientist, I was not very successful. I was demoted. I never had RO1 grant, uh, no prestige, no money, no. But, uh, you know, I did um, uh, good progress in the laboratory. I always had at least one person who had money and could pay that salary to me. And um, <laughs> for me, moving to uh, a company, I first, as I mentioned, we also established with Drew Weissman our own company, but uh, we couldn't get the patent for our company. So I went to somebody else, small companies. And for me, it was um, a big delight. Uh, I enjoyed very much because um, the goal was no longer, uh, you know, to get another paper and then whatever committee <laughs> membership or something which counts for, for academia, but it was that we have to generate a product which is helping somebody. So that was the goal was so much better than prior to that, you know, it's all of these uh, uh, grants and uh, getting grants and more money and more, more, more of everything. Here it was that we have to have a product which is helping somebody. And the other uh, delight, what other I enjoyed is that everybody worked together. So, so it, and there were no you and me and whose name as, there was no paper to first author, last author. It was that everybody worked, together. And that was also, for me, it was, uh, uh, I enjoy very much that finally, you know, everybody worked together. And the goal is to have a product, because if we don't have a product which helps somebody, then we can go home. 
So that what was my experience. Thank you, Katie. Um, very, very helpful, very insightful to hear the, uh, the, the contrast and the focus, right, that focus on product development. So, Laura, you're in the thick of it um, with uh, knowing a number of your uh, founders from Penn who are incredibly prolific and wonderful <coughs> collaborators. Tell us about how you're bridging the gap or, you know, focusing on company resources versus academic resources and kind of working uh, that opportunity and I, I would say sometimes challenge <laughs> to make that work. Yeah, I think it is a challenge. And um, first of all, I'll start out by saying that I think we never really know and we're, it's, there's, there's so many surprises along the way. And What's right for me might not be right for others. And, you know, I um, have been in a place where I've joined companies where I think it was too soon um, to have come out of academia. And that was when I joined Phenomics, which was a forward genetics company. Yeah. And, you know, wow, you could parachute into causative drivers of disease. Who wouldn't want to do that, right? Well, it still took months, sometimes years to do that. Of course, now Bruce Boitler, I think, can positionally clone in six days. But back then, you couldn't even do it in six months. It wasn't quite ready. And of course, you know, I also, when I joined Synthorix, which came out of Floyd Romsberg's lab, and it was this artificial base pair called X and Y that we were inserting you know, novel amino acids into polypeptide chains, I, I was like, oh my God, this is like never gonna work. And, but um, but it, it did work. And not only that, but it could, um, you know, it, re, it taught us we could do something different with IL-2. Yep. So sometimes you never know. And of course, my philosophy is that big ideas need to come with big money important investors have to buy in and come along for the ride because um, that to me says there's more heads around the table and big problems take a lot of smart people. But that's not always the case. Many people, I know many people that start companies with friends and family money and they are very successful. It might not be for me, but it could be for you. And, and that's okay. So I think that we just never know. But I do like what Katie mentioned about the collaborative nature of biotech. It's something that um, I noticed right away 30 years ago when I, first jo when I joined my first biotech company that you have to have that collaboration. You have to have the right founders. You have to have the right investors. You have to have the right team. And that team has to complement each other. You have to be very different. If you're all the same, it, it's never going to work. So, uh, you know, I think that um, it, can, it can be different, but there are some common elements that are very important. Very helpful. A lot of insight, a lot of experiences here. Thank you, Laura. So, Mike, um, you're, you're on to your next, your journey with a new company. Tell us about the experience and what your experience has been on trying to get the company started, but, and it's okay to talk about our interactions if you want, because <laughs> um, I was not successful in uh, becoming an investor, although I wanted to be, um, of Mike's work, but there's always the next one in the future, so I'm not <laughs> giving up hope. Um, but Mike, tell us about the experience and then you know what you hope for as you start the journey. Yeah, so um, it's it's really interesting how Beth uh, it went, Beth, because um, when I started as an academic, I had no intention of starting a company. Even after being in Bob Langer's lab, who started many companies, I, I love teaching students, um, creating new technologies in the lab. Um, and it was around the time, or I would say COVID hit, that we would just be getting lots of companies just doing the same type of call with us. They would say, hey, Mike, I have cargo X or cargo Y or cargo Z, but um, when we take this off the shelf lipid, it's not working. It's work. not going to the tissue that yeah. we needed to. Um, 
And what we would tell them is it's not a one size fit all approach uh, with drug delivery um, and nanotechnology. Um, it really takes tailoring of the cargo or something like Capstan does, which is amazing targeted strategies to get the specific cargo, the nucleic acid of interest to sell and tissues of interest. Um, and a lot of these companies would come back to us and say, you know, well, we don't actually know how to develop a pipeline to actually do that. Can, can you start working with us on this? Um, and then we would have help with people like Ben and others at PCI where we would start doing sponsored research um, with these different companies. Uh, but then as COVID hit, we, we would get more and more and more of these requests with all of these novel cargos you know, coming out onto the market. Um, and one of the things we thought of is, could we potentially do something bigger here? Um, because like you said, Beth, you know, we're going to develop the technology. You know, we're going to evaluate it in a mouse. But can we push the boundaries here and develop a vehicle that could develop therapeutics to test in large animals um, and ultimately humans? Um, so it was about around halfway through COVID, these conversations started changing from you know, big pharma and doing SRAs, which we still do, of course, but then talking to VCs um, in this space for a company that we could develop. Um, and we wanted to do something that was, you know, we're very interested in developing platforms as a lot, but we also wanted to be very focused in what we developed in therapeutics. Um, so we kind of found that perfect marriage um, with Liberate Bio to push that vision forward where we still continuously develop exciting new platforms, but then specifically target therapeutic areas of interest. What's your favorite cargo to deliver? <laughs> You're really putting me on the spot it's so here, hard. <laughs> I'll have to say, since we're on an mRNA panel, <laughs> I will say mRNA because, and I'm sure we'll get into this, there's a lot of versatility here. There's not yeah. just vaccines, but we'll talk about protein replacement therapies, but we'll talk about gene editing as well, where we could deliver a combination of mRNA with guide RNA. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of exciting new cargos um, that I'm sure many of you have seen so far at the JP Morgan meeting um, in the editing space, but we could also think about other RNAs, like circular RNAs, that could be very important for delivery as well. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Liberate is off the ground. So congratulations on that. That's wonderful. Um, so maybe let's take a minute and then um, we'll open it up for some audience questions as well. Uh, but I'm sure, and I want to caveat this, that I, I know there are some pharma companies and, and press in the audience here. So um, for our panelists who, who know that, but just to remind you, um, what's next? What's next? What, what you know, if, if you had to kind of, you know, you can't predict the future, but at least say, you know, this looks like it's going to be feasible um, with the technology, whether it's mRNA or in Mike's case, delivery. Um, what are you most excited about? Katie, back to you. Yeah, so I am most excited about the delivery because I think that that's the most critical one that uh, uh, reaching different kind of uh, tissues, cell types, uh, organs, and uh, so that would open possibility for many other therapies and uh, delivering to the central nervous system and so on. I know that at uh, present, uh, you know, the RNA with the particle will not go from cell to cell to cell, but who knows, maybe Mike will come up with something. <laughs> no, no pressure. pressure Mike. No, <laughs> it's all on you. It's amazing to me. And I've been in this industry for you know, well over 30 plus plus years and um, delivery was never sexy until now. And now, because we have all these incredible technologies like mRNA, circular RNA, gene editing, delivery is front and center. It's, it's really um, come of age, and, and I would say it is sexy right now, and it's really, really important. So we so appreciate what you're working on, Mike. Um, Laura. Yeah, for me, I really think about it from the patient perspective, you know, probably because I, you know, had that you have cancer uh, a conversation back way back in 20, 2006, but um, when I got my ovarian cancer diagnosis, and you know we do go through the big shock of, okay, what if I only have six months to live? What do I want to do? And um, you know I had the surgery and I had the chemotherapy and it was a different era, 
Of course, I had been profiling other people's tumors in the lab. I thought I could get my own tumor profile, but I couldn't. Um, and that's what prompted me to start Clarity Foundation. But um, you know, I think about it from the standpoint of wanting people to have their cures. And you know, that is why I love cell therapy for as complicated as, as it is, you know, some people with certain cancers get cured. And that didn't happen 10 years ago. And if, if people have not seen the movie of Medicine and Miracles, you absolutely must see it. Um, but, you know, that's how I think of it. How do we get more patients their cures? And the promise of delivery has now collided with, um, with getting more people access to the type of treatments that gives you a chance, more people a chance to have their cures. So if I think about the limitations of cell therapy and how um, you, know, you have to, whether it's autologous or allogeneic, you know, it's a still a big, big process, and only 20% of people that are eligible for cell therapy actually get it. So if I think about how we can get to the other 80%, how we can learn from that to move in from heme malignancies to solid tumors, gosh, that is so exciting to me. So um, I think that, yes, that's what I'm looking forward to, is more people getting their cures. Thank you, and we're delighted that uh, you're here to talk yeah, to us about so all of that. <laughs> I bet you are. <laughs> but thank you, and thank you for, you know, it, it is being on the mission and staying true to uh, the core of what I think so many people in this room and, and um, with us remotely are really focused on. So thank you for that. Mike, what organ? Where are you going next? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think one thing, I'm, we're very excited about the uh, cancer immunotherapy space. I mean, the stuff that's being done in Capstan right now, where we could make something like an engineered immune cell therapy, something that could be injected into a patient is going to be transformational. Um, my lab in particular in the cancer space, we're also interested in seeing now that we're developing all these technologies. You know, a decade ago, before mRNA, we thought a lot about cancer nanomedicine in terms of going into solid tumors, uh, but we faced a lot of barriers to do it. We think with now new LMP technologies that we're developing in the lab, we can now navigate um, different types of LMP ch technologies systemically into solid tumors um, and also metastases as well. So we're very excited about that. Um, and then one area that's a little bit lesser known that I would like to mention that my lab's interested in, it's not really um, an organ of particular of interest, but it's the area of fetal and maternal therapy. Can we potentially intervene with a mother who's pregnant right before birth um, and deliver different types of mRNA technologies in a safe and effective manner where we can then intervene and correct different diseases before a child is born. Um, and we believe we can do this with mRNA technology. And you know, at Penn, right across the street, we have Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So we collaborate with a lot of fetal surgeons and the advances that they're making now in an image-guided therapy to deliver therapeutics to a child right before they're born are transformational. And there could be a lot of opportunities here to deliver because right before a child's born, they don't have the disease pathology present. So if we think of something like cystic fibrosis, it's very hard to get a therapeutic through a fibrous lung. But before birth, they'll have that mutation, but that fibrous uh, pathology won't be there just yet. And we're starting to develop a range of new LMP technologies for these applications for different organs uh, right before a child's born. So we're very excited about that as well. It is really exciting. exciting. A window into the future for all of us. Thank you um, for all the great work, everybody on this panel, and I know many of you in the audience are doing. So let's turn it over to the audience. I think there are mics on. We're just going to be able to have some uh, questions asked to the panelists uh, from people in the room. Sorry for those uh, remotely. Um, we can't accommodate that. But are there questions? I see hands going up. Raise your hands. Stand up to a mic. Um, please. Thank you. Um, please forgive me. Press the button. Press right here. Oh, okay. 
Uh, sorry, I hope, hope you didn't answer this, but what are some of the major deep tech things that are interfering with mRNA and data-driven uh, modeling of trials that you think are fundamental industry-level problems or fundamental large breakthroughs that enable and remove some of the actual um, uh, uh, building, uh, uh, what's the term, um, just things that are in the way of that. What are some major large pieces that we have to do? Solve their mRNA, we're starting to be able to model <coughs> data with machine learning, and even using some of the other uh, data, da data analysis tools with AI. What are some of the pieces that are still in the way of us really deeply analyzing, and looking at, and speeding up the delivery of diseases, um, solutions, and also the medicines and other breakthrough things we're gonna need? Great, great question, um, really around barriers for um, delivery again and new technologies and tools. I think, Mike, do you want to take that? I, I mean, I've been amazed at some of the barcoding work, other things that you're working on, uh, maybe to comment. Yeah, so the question was, I'm sorry, the question was around some of the barriers um, that we face for translation for mRNA. Um, no, just overall, with mRNA and also data analysis of the things that are coming out of this type of research, what are the same problems? mRNA specifically, but overall, in the, in the, what's standing in the way of the breakthroughs, and mRNA being fully what it could be, that deep tech people were investing in, and in this space can help you guys reach. Yeah, no. Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities in this space for some of the challenges that we're facing uh, for machine learning um, and AI to potentially solve, and these are things we're actively um, looking at right now. Um, one of the challenges that we face in this space is as we go to extrahepatic delivery, if we want to target a neuron, if we want to target a muscle cell, what are the glowing targets that we're looking at? If we want to take, say, a targeting strategy and hit a receptor on those cells, what are the receptors that we want to hit? We want to hit something that is potentially exclusively targeted, uh, expressed on that cell type, but then we'll also enter the cell. Um, so there's a lot of exciting work being done right now in the computational space for target identification on different cell types of interest. So potentially one day with the capstan approach, you could look at different targets and different cells um, and then insert into your targeting system the coordinates to then target those cells and tissues. Um, what we also do um, in our lab as well is when you have different types of mRNAs or mRNAs with guide RNAs for CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing is the nanoparticle is very complex to make. It's a mixture of different lipids and RNA. It almost has an onion-like structure. And when you t switch out the different cargos, you sometimes need to re-optimize all of the components to package all of those components and deliver them to a cell type of interest. So we've also found machine learning and AI approaches to be very important when we take a different type of cargo, how do we tailor the LMP around it? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And just to add, and I know that Katie will want to comment on this too, because it's it is the it is it's one thing to know the the amino acid sequence of a protein and to turn that into an mRNA that will encode uh, for that um, uh, protein at the right uh, level. And there's a lot of optimization that needs to go on um, once you have taken that amino acid sequence and turned it into an RNA. And Katie, you've probably experienced that um, with the spike protein, but all of the other work that you've done too, it's codon optimization, it's, the length of it, it's the length, it's how, how big of a poly A tail. There's so many optimizations that you have to do. You want to comment on that, Katie? Uh, I might rather just talk about that, you know, what is the protein? If this protein and most of this thing you could see at the beginning was a secreted protein. So then in that case, it doesn't matter in many times uh, which cell is making. So, you know, for uh, erythropoietin production, which is normal in the kidney, you didn't need a huge uh, needle to reach the kidney cells, but uh, subcutaneously, intramuscularly, you can inject anywhere the mRNA and the cell locally then they can produce and those uh, secreted protein can get to the circulation and reach uh, the site where it is important. The reaching the specific cells, of course, when that uh, protein replacement or that uh, uh, protein is intracellular, then, then it is the challenging uh, 
part because then you have to reach those cells and um, so that's uh, you know chance and of course you know many many other things what you just mentioned the optimization and sometimes uh, you know not just the codon optimization but um, you know sometimes you have to avoid codon optimization because uh, you can run into a out of uh, frame translational product which <laughs> will be very immunogenic or activ activate something else but uh, uh, you have to do a lot of trial and error on that uh, aspect also. Yeah, that's a good point about you can, in some aspects, you can turn any cell into a factory and have an effect. Other times you have to deliver specific to, to a certain cell type. Yeah, yeah, no, very, very good comments. Thank you. Other questions? Let's go that way. Okay, thanks. I press the button. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you have to continue to hold it down. I got it. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, question about ministration. Is that a, um, has that been a rate limiting barrier? Typically, uh, we're using IV intravenous or um, IT uh, to deliver nanoparticles containing the therapeutic agent. And I just wonder if there's, um, enough of a barrier in terms of route of administration to try and develop oral formulations or intranasal? Yeah, that's a great question. And this is something we're excited about and we think about um, in the lab all the time. Um, and this goes back to what I'm saying in terms of, um, you know, when we think about LMPs and delivery of RNA, it's not a one size, you know, fit all approach. Size of your particles are important, how they respond to local tissues and the proteins and enzymes that are there are very important. Um, so if you take a lipid that might work well for a vaccine, that might not be the best lipid that you do for systemic administration. One, you might want local immune cell recruitment, but one, you might want being immune silent uh, within the bloodstream. Um, so how we really look at it as a lab is really developing kind of a suite of different LMP technologies that could be administered uh, through different routes. Um, so for the, in the case of the vaccine, when we design a vaccine in the lab, we want immune cells to hone in on that LMP. Um, but then um, when we design one for IV administration, we want minimal cytokine release. We want little immune cell recognition, but that could vary um, when we think about other applications as well. So if we wanna deliver into the brain, if we think about gene therapy before RNA, if we think about the viral field, they might do something like an ICV injection into the CNS. Their parameters, such as the size of the particle, you want something very, very tiny that's able to diffuse through the brain. Um, so long story short, when we think about these different applications, it's gonna require an LMP that's tailored to that administration route, but also what that cargo is, is very important in how we develop that LMP, whether it's mRNA, circular RNA, plasma DNA, it's gonna be a very different LMP. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, Question over here. Yeah, um, I, I was hoping you guys could comment on the manufacturing process. I mean, obviously we've scaled this at the global scale and, and we, we did it and we did it pretty quickly, but um, where are the gaps and what, what does that look like in, in the future? So maybe I'll start, um, I'm sure Katie will want to comment too. So, you know, as we think about um, accessing the different components, it can be anything from who has the capabilities to provide the right lipids under GLP, who has the capability in our case to provide antibodies that we conjugate to the LMP, who has the components to make the many parts of RNA, which super expensive right now. So anything we can do to cut down on that cost would be a, a game changer. You know, we, we did, o over time, we've run into different manufacturing challenges as an industry. It used to be there was plenty of E. coli capabilities, and then it all went to Cho cells, and you couldn't get enough of E. coli. And now, now it's like, oh, now we can't make enough uh, you know, LMPs under GMP. So there, there are some um, limitations today that I guess you know, the supply and demand will help overcome. Katie, any, thanks, thanks, Laura. 
Any comments on that manufacturing challenges? So, so you know, we, we have not mentioned the RNA is very cheap and very quickly can be made and so on, but uh, many people already learn about that. So uh, when, uh, when it is about like, let's say a vaccine and how you can shorten the time, make it faster or something, you know, it seems that many limitation, maybe not from the production side, but more like, uh, you know, there is not a global regulation so that uh, uh, when they say FDA approved, it won't in other country, it says that we have to retest it so that, you know, there is not a global regulatory unit for like, pandemia. And also, you know, the other things, we can make the vaccine, but it has to be injected to the people and the anti-vaxxer and all of these uh, educational things. Maybe it is uh, something we more likely have to work on rather than, you know, production, because uh, if we produce it and then you know, there are uh, people are spreading uh, fake news and uh, other things. And so there are maybe some problems should be solved there and we have to work on it. Yeah, very good challenge to put out there and the global regulatory standards would be much appreciated by the entire industry. I'm glad you brought that up, Katie. Thank you. Let me- uh, Just straight ahead, this yeah. question. Sorry. Oh. So I have a question on the partnership. Um, so for the innovator in the panel, so when you consider which farmer uh, to work with, beyond the money and the nice personalities, what other factors you would typically consider? Nobody said nice. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have to pass the hors d'oeuvre tray. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. What, what are the other challenges? Yeah. Well, no, what other or factors you would consider to factors. say you decide to work with A versus B or C? Yeah, well, there, you want there to be a complementarity, right? I mean, um, we, we uh, want there to be, we want to give something to the collaboration and we want to learn something from the collaboration. Uh, so I think that's, that's important that there's a synergy between the pers potential partnerships there. I've done lots of different kinds of partnerships and you know, those are the ones that work the best, in my opinion. Good point. Oh, my God. How much longer do we, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Two more. Who are the lucky people? All right, I haven't gone on this side. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is being recorded, I think. I'm not sure they're going to want to comment. <laughs> uh, go ahead, guys. I'm not saying a word. <laughs> Anybody want to say a word? All the data points to the fact that we should be vaccinated. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes, that would be amazing. Okay, one last. Yes, in, in a post-pandemic environment, um, can you comment on whether the FDA will still be as flexible in understanding for other therapeutic applications of mRNA? It depends on the unmet need. And it depends on where the risk benefit lies and what the standard of care of therapy is and who has access. In some instances, they'll be very flexible. In other instances, they won't be flexible at all. And it also depends a lot on the reviewer. It's amazingly it heterogeneous. But, but yeah, risk benefit is usually the biggest um, factor. Katie, any, any thoughts? Because you, I mean, you work globally, and so you may have a perspective as well. Okay, great. Well, um, I think we're all, we, where did Lori go, there she is. Um, we're all gonna be able to gather outside, right? So yes. there's another opportunity. Over to you, thank yes. you. Um, and a lot of what you all highlighted was how important 
uh, having multiple partners in of academia, the private sector, pharma, investors, um, to tackle all these you know, new challenges and opportunities that um, we heard about today. So we wanted to thank so many of you here in the room for working with us, um, you know, the cast and moving forward. I also wanted to highlight that John Sportley has built a really amazing team at PCI the last decade wonderful way. There's a lot of new activity um, happening at Penn. Uh, and besides Ben, we have several colleagues here. Um, my colleague Jim Bowen, I'm Laurie Ackerman from PCI, by the way. Uh, my colleague Sam Sabello, Carter Caldwell, Michael Clausell, um, and you know, please come find us. Uh, we're out here in San Francisco to see you all in person for the first time in a while, which is amazing. And also to invite you to back to Philadelphia. We have partners from around the world, but um, what's happening in Philadelphia is really amazing. We have all this innovation. We have a lot of new infrastructure to support the innovation. So we have companies and startups that are now started and growing around Penn and around Philadelphia. So um, it's, it's amazing to see. And um, if you haven't been to Philadelphia, now's a great time to come. Um, and I also just wanted to mention um, we have um, 37 companies currently raising money, and we did try to put these flyers outside for a list. So there's a lot happening. We'll obviously um, put this on our website for you to talk about these companies. And um, I just wanted to give the final word to our sponsor, Sol Ewing, who has actually been with us from the beginning. Um, started this seven years ago. And in particular, um, Catherine Doyle is not here today, but she's been an amazing supportive partner. Her team is amazing, and um, we're just so grateful for um, them and to be able to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Billy Nassou. I'm a partner with Saul Wheely, which is a law firm that is heavily yeah, embedded in the life sciences of practice. I'm the only thing sitting between you and the, and the food outside, so I'll be very brief. Uh, we have had the opportunity and the pleasure of working with several members, such as Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Weisman, Dr. June. And uh, as you can tell, this is a very interactive environment. We have people from different areas coming together, doing basic science, but always looking our translation and translating that into actual therapies. And it's a very fertile environment that we heard about that today. Um, I'm a campus background, and it's amazing to me how fast science changes. When it started out in research, pretty much in the Middle Ages, the big thing was combinatorial chemistry, right? Combinatorial chemistry was going to solve all the problems in the world, and all the targets would be finding them for all the targets. Uh, that didn't really pan out. It's a great tool. People use it still, but it hasn't addressed all the questions. If you went to the first meeting here, and you said basically the seventh meeting was going to be about mRNA technology, people would say you were great, and now it's a reality. And actually, that's one of the major reasons why we're here today, and we're not on Zoom, thank God, uh, and we are able to interact. It's due to the technology that's been developed in the, in the last few years. Um, so, as just I have a personal request. Uh, as you know, uh, it, you may know, Princeton has preserved the last uh, 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 blackboards from uh, Einstein. So I think Pam should pre really preserve that Xerox machine. Great. Thank you very much. Katie, thank you for joining us. And uh, to my fellow panelists, thank you.